Uh, you may have noticed that I've been working my way through the book of Daniel, and we're going to do some more of that today. And I was musing on, well, why am I doing this? You'd think I'd know. I, I kind of know, but I'm putting it into words. Uh, why Daniel? Why now? And you might think, well, Daniel, yeah, you know, people are upset about what's going on in the world, so we want to think about prophecy, what's going on in the end time. Yeah, but that's actually not where I'm coming from. Um, trying to take a look at the book of Daniel as how to gain a godly perspective in a culturally and intellectually hostile environment. And that's the approach that I'm taking. I think we'll still touch on prophetic things, but overall I'm kind of interested in how did Daniel and, and his, his buddies deal with the, a terrible and difficult situation. The message or the title for today's message is The God Who Is Able to Deliver. The God Who Is Able to Deliver. And we're going to take a look at the third chapter of Daniel, which is uh, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the terrible trial that they faced. So let me just start right there. We'll go to Daniel 3, and I'm going to start off reading verses 1 through 3. King Nebuchadnezzar, we've met him before. We've taken a look a little bit at King Nebuchadnezzar in previous messages. He made an image of gold, and it was 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, big. And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, and magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come up to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, and advisors, treasurers, judges, and magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. In the previous section of Daniel, which we looked at last month, Nebuchadnezzar had experienced a dream. And in his dream, he dreamt or was given a vision of a giant golden statue. Well, I have a golden head, silver arms, bronze thighs, iron legs, right? And Daniel, the man of God, interpreted that dream for him. And that dream, just by you know, brief review, foretold the sequence of worldly kingdoms that would dominate the earth from the time of Israel's demise until the return of the Messiah. A lot of territory. And the return of the Messiah, of course, would be the end of the age. And in that vision, Nebuchadnezzar had been, he'd been given a very flattering role to play uh, he, he'd been told, you, O Nebuchadnezzar, are that head of gold. And uh, all these subsequent kingdoms that came after were, you know, of lesser value. You know, silver, bronze, iron. Uh, and we'll see, I think, we'll see that he might have let that kind of go to his head and gotten the wrong idea or taken that idea in his own direction. Nebuchadnezzar at that time, when the interpretation came to him, had fallen down before Daniel and he'd acknowledged Yahweh as the God of gods. You know, not a true believer, but acknowledging there's something here. This Daniel guy represents a God that, yeah, there's something here. Here was a God who could truly speak to the mysteries and foretell the future. Now, in a similar manner, we, you and me, we might be convinced of the living God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Scripture, whatever you like. We might be convinced that this God who's working with us is a God who gives revelation of truth. And we understand mysteries and we understand things. He tells us what is good and what is evil. We know true doctrine. He gives us a glimpse into the future, opens up promises of what's beyond to us, promises of glory beyond our death in the flesh. 
And all that's true, very true, very important. But God is more than a reliable source of information. The living God is an active being who is engaged. And he's engaged with his creation. He's engaged with you. And he's engaged with me. He's engaged with this church. He's especially engaged with those whom he has called and chosen. He's engaged with a lot of people, all people really, but he's especially engaged with those he has called and chosen. And your God can deliver. And he can deliver you from trials and tests and calamity. And he wants you to have this view. He is a God of power and knowledge. Not just knowledge. You know, we might know about the Sabbath, the holy days, what is the true destiny of mankind, but we also need to know that God is a God of power. If we don't, we might be like those people who as Paul said, have the form of religion, but deny the power of it. And we don't want to be that way. Go quickly to John 11. John 11. And uh, we're going to single out poor old Mary again. She gets uh, a lot of bad notations. (laughs) It's not being very... Where Here she, Here's an example. Lazarus has died, and Jesus arrives on the scene, and he's already dead. And they think, well, it's done now. Um, verse 11, let's pick it up. Oh, sorry, we're in chapter 11, verse 21. So he meets Mary, who's a sister of Lazarus. And uh, Mary says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now it's too late, you know. How are you going to heal him? Now he's dead. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And she answers, I know he will rise again in the resurrection in the last day. So she knew the head knowledge, you know. Ah, there's a promise of resurrection. She'd heard the teaching. But she didn't really think there was anything Jesus could do. Now, he goes on to raise Lazarus just to show and make a point God can deliver. In the same manner, we might try and sometimes soften our disappointment at unanswered prayer by looking forward to something beyond, you know, the big picture kind of stuff, the final deliverance from death. But God also wants you and me to trust him in the action of the moment, what's happening now. And so if you are in a trial, call out to him as the God who is able to deliver. So what might Nebuchadnezzar have been thinking? Well, based on the sequence of events, it's very likely that Nebuchadnezzar got the idea for building his giant statue uh, from the dream that he had. He might have thought, yeah, (laughs) wow, a giant golden statue, that'd be cool. And uh, he would use this image which he, he had built as a test of loyalty to the Babylonian state. Now, in the mind of a man like Nebuchadnezzar, I, this would have made total sense. It would have made sense. The God of heaven had given him power, right? That was part of the interpretation. You are the head of gold. God had given him the power, the dominion over man and beast and territory. The God of heaven had said, you're the head of gold. Well, why shouldn't all people then swear allegiance to such a glorious state? It's kind of like the divine right of kings way back in the time of Babylon. Now, that statue would have been about 90 feet tall. Cubits, we don't use cubits anymore, so I'll put it in feet, 90 feet. That's about the height of a nine-story building. And the dimensions provided, well, they would have seemed kind of weird. 
um, you know, there would have been a very, very tall, very thin, almost like a totem pole kind of a looking um, structure. Uh, the height, just, you know, for some background information, might have been because it was on a base platform and uh, the figure might have stood on that. And in the 1800s, this guy here, Julius Opert, uh, located the remains of an enormous brick structure and it was 12 miles southeast of Babylon in the modern-day town of Hilia, which is about four miles south of ancient Babylon. And that corresponds to the location that was described in Scripture. Uh, some think that this uh, it's 45 feet tall, this 45-foot tall base might have been what the statue actually was on. Uh, so large statues, large statues constructed by kings in ancient times were not uncommon. For example, the Great Sphinx in Egypt, that's 66 feet high, big, 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 uh, with a lion body and a human head, and that was built around 2500 BC. Uh, there's lots of statues in Egypt of Ramesses II and other pharaohs, and they're huge. Additional examples of ginormous statues in ancient history. The Colossus of Rhodes, I don't know if you ever heard of that, but uh, that's around 300 BC. That would have been 105 feet tall. And uh, the great statue of Zeus in Olympia, that's 40 feet tall, you know, a little less. Uh, so well, my point is this. The statue is not the stuff of myth or fantasy or children's stories. You might have read to your children, we did, stories about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the giant statue. Well, I just put that in just so you know, the, the giant statue is, is real. They did stuff like that. It was very common. Another question. Was this, was this an image of Nebuchadnezzar himself? Did he build a giant statue of himself? Well, possibly. It's a little bit of a sidebar. But the Babylonians didn't actually consider the king to be a divine being. That was the case in other countries, Egypt, later on Rome, uh, but not the Babylonians. So more likely it was a statue of Marduk or something like that, uh, which would have, uh, well, Marduk was the head of the Babylonian pantheon, you know, all the gods when they get together in a big assembly. Marduk is the like the chairman of the board, you know, he's, he's in charge. And so this Marduk, also known as Baal, would serve as a representation of the glorious state of Babylon. So there's this weird connection of religion and nationhood and stuff like that, that that we find when we look at what's going on in the ancient world. The problem came because these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had to declare themselves we we're going to call people out and we want them to declare themselves, okay? Um, and uh, declarations of allegiance to a state are pretty common. In the U.S., for example, we have our Pledge of Allegiance, right? You know, uh, which seems, you know, fairly benign, not you know, wrapped up in a lot of religious stuff. Um, the early Christians would have faced a lot of friction in their time, uh, when the Roman state demanded they pledge allegiance um, and, you know, they expected people to offer incense to images of the emperor who was declared a god. Now, that created a little bit more friction there. Now, in our day, as I mentioned, pledges of allegiance don't seem to have a lot of religious content. But I think, as we have seen in the past couple of years, Everything can change very, very quickly. Very quickly. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to have religious content to be problematic. We might also be called upon to give our approval of certain things that God detests. In the past few years, it has become increasingly common to hear demands that everybody needs to declare their, where they stand on this particular issue. I'm not going to get into the issues that are up there for grabs. Some are good, some are bad. 
but it's very common. It's a new way of thinking. No, you need to take a stand, and I need to hear you say it. And you see this uh, in the workplace, and more and more in the workplace, where you're expected to you know, take a stand. You need to be here at the celebration of X. Or you see it on a, lot, a lot on social media, places like that. And many of these controversies, they seem totally secular. Well, it's about secular things. It's not a religious-oriented thing. But they end up, if you dig down, they end up getting mixed together with religious attitudes. That's why there's a controversy. And it creates confusion. Now right now, for you and me, this calls for wisdom. In the future, it might call more upon courage and faith. But for right now, think of the scripture uh, in Romans 14, verse 22. He's talking about something a little different, but he says, Paul says, Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself or herself by what they approve of. Let me get back to Daniel here. Pick it up in verse 4 and through verse 7. Then the herald, so they've all gathered to this statue, right? The herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zithers, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and the peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, Babylon's government was very cosmopolitan. They were very cosmopolitan. Um, you know, they conquered nations and they brought people into Babylon and as we read earlier in Daniel, they appointed officials and bureaucrats from all kinds of territories that they conquered. And they wanted everybody to assimilate. That was the goal. They wanted people to assimilate and become part of this giant super state that they were creating. And the call to fall down and worship, well, that, that kind of points towards this being an image of Marduk instead of, Babel, instead of Nebuchadnezzar himself. But the circumstances seem more political than religious. I mean, he's drawing in all the bureaucrats and the government officials and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's very political what he's doing here. But it's all mushed together with kind of religious stuff. It was probably very confusing. You know, it'd be in a situation like that, I think it'd be easy to kind of rationalize your way. Well, you know, actually, what? Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, it's okay. Uh, uh, nah. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. It'd be very easy to come up with ways to work around mentally, I think. Um, it was confusing. Now, they're threatened with something pretty bad, death in a fiery furnace, right? A fiery furnace. And that actually was uh, just a very common form of capital punishment in Babylon. Uh, take a quick jog over to Jeremiah 29. Verse 22. Remember, Jeremiah is writing in uh, the same time period, a bit of overlap with Daniel. Jeremiah 29, verse 22 says, because, and this is talking about the uh, disgraced leaders of Israel, because of them, all the exiles from Judah who are in Babylon will use this curse. May the Lord treat you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon burned in the fire. So this is something that the Babylonians did. They burned people in a fire. Pretty nasty way to die, I would think. The fiery furnace that Nebuchadnezzar was using, if you, the practicality of it, it was probably the smelting furnace that was used to create this giant metal image. They would have had a smelting furnace right there to do the work. It would have been very easy, handy, right there. Ready to go. 
So let's pick it up here in verse 8. Verse 8. At this time, some astrologers, and I want to read through verse 12, came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and pipe, no bass, bummer, no bass, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing fire. But there are some Jews who you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. They're disloyal. You need to deal with these people. Now, I, I mentioned it a little bit as a foreshadowing a couple of months ago. There was probably a fair bit of resentment in the courts of Babylon uh, towards these Jewish men. They ate special food, right? Remember the big trial that the whole book started off with was about food and they were going to get a special diet. It didn't sound particularly appetizing, but nevertheless, they're separating themselves from other people. And when you do that with people, people don't like that, do they? You know, if someone's doing something they ought not be doing and you say, well, I'm I'm not going to be part of it, and you separate yourself from them. What's the response you get? You're judging me. All I did was move aside. But that's how people think. That's how people react. I think there was a lot of that kind of stuff going on here. Uh, I mean, they ate different food. They were getting higher. They were getting these great appointments in the government. What's not to hate? <laughs> a lot of jealousy going on there. They would specifically single these men out. These Jews you've put in these positions are not loyal. They're not doing the thing you told us to do. All right, pick up, it up uh, verse 13, and let's go through verse 18. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is this true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I have made you, good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing fire. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Now Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. We're not, we're not going to argue with you on this. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set. When Nebuchadnezzar brings him in, he, he comes, he kind of sounds like he's just, he's floored. I, it's just, I can't believe this is happening. This is true. Are you guys doing this? After all I've done for you, is it true? And he, he, you kind of get the sense that he sort of might have had a soft spot for these guys and kind of liked them. Why? Because he's giving them a second chance. He basically says, okay, here we go again. I'm going to give you a second chance. If you fall down, then it'll be okay. But if you don't, then I'm going to punish you. So he's giving them a second, second shake at it. And, uh, you know, maybe they were just really efficient and effective servants and he didn't want to lose them and stuff like that. And he says something as part of his threat, which is interesting. What God can rescue you from my hand? So he had a viewpoint of this God, even though God had interpreted his dream through Daniel for him, he had a view of God that was a little deficient, if you will. Through the dream, the interpretation provided by Daniel, uh, Yahweh, God of Israel, God of Scripture, your God, my God, had been shown, or what showed himself to Nebuchadnezzar, 
as all-knowing, knew the dream, knew what knew the thoughts of your mind, was able to foretell the future, who spoke truth and dispensed enlightenment. That's pretty cool stuff, right? What, what people want from God or expect from God. And perhaps Nebuchadnezzar was the sort of person who was willing to see your God and my God, the living God, as a spiritual entity. Yeah, there's something to this. It's out there, it's a real, it's a spiritual force in the universe. But he didn't think that this God had power. He did not think that this God had much power in the material realm. Such a God would not be able to intervene. Such a God would not deliver these three men from the hands of the king. Such a God would not thwart the will of the great king. You know, hey, the gods, the spiritual things in this world, they have their realm, but the king has his realm. Now through the trial and the testing of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, the God of Israel was about to expand, <laughs> expand the understanding that Nebuchadnezzar had. Uh, the God of Israel is more than the God of, of mind and spirit. More than just, you know, a dispenser of enlightenment and information. He is the God who is supreme and who rules in power over all material and created things. Now, these three are put to the ultimate test. And, you know, we, we read their response. And their response, what they said, and then their subsequent delivery, which we'll read about soon, is a witness. As we've seen in the book of Daniel over and over again, these things are a witness for Nebuchadnezzar, for Babylon, for history, and for you and for me. Your God, the living God, does have such power over physical and material matters. They say, he is able. Where am I? Verse 14. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us. And then most translations, almost all, go on to say, um, and he will deliver us. Is that what yours says? Anyone have something other than that? Yeah. Yeah, I looked at a lot of translations, and most of them say will. He will deliver us. However, when you get into one of those little word studies, as you know I like to do, uh, it could also be translated as can deliver us or may deliver us. So which statement shows greater faith? Which shows greater faith, will deliver or may deliver? If we take the translation will, will deliver, that indicates a very solid confidence in God, does it not? Seems pretty solid, right? I think it is solid. And, you know, a person who's facing a trial, they might say, God will cure me of cancer. And I've met people who are in the midst of a trial who that's the approach they take. You might have as well. God will cure me of cancer. But we, you know, and I know, that faithful people die of cancer. And that's not because God does not have the power to deliver. It's a matter of his divine wisdom. And for some, endurance unto death may be the best way to develop holy, righteous character and trust and faith. Now, if the three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are saying, 
God will deliver us. I suppose one way we could look at it, uh, considering the circumstances of Daniel and you know, all the prophecy that's wrapped up in the book, you know, we could say, well, this is some sort of a prophetic foreknowledge. God's going to save us. You could, you could say that. And then you know, immediate proof is given to Nebuchadnezzar. It's one way you could look at it. So the second one, may deliver. If we take the translation may, that kind of opens up the possibility that God may not. However, that again is not a matter of lack of power. Your God, the living God, does not lack the power to do so. He does not lack the power over material events. This leaves the matter up to his sovereign will. So which statement shows greater faith? I think they both show faith. They're both, I think they're reasonable approaches. Um, but if you notice, they go on, the three go on to say, even if he does not rescue us, don't they? That's what they say. Even if he does not rescue us, we are still sticking with it. That's what they say. So I think, you know, kind of baked in there is, is showing that they knew that it was a possibility that God would not deliver them. Go to Job 13, verse 15. Just a couple of quick I, th I guess, inspirational type verses here. Uh, not necessarily memory scriptures, but it's good to know that this isn't the, you know, you get the same idea in other places in scripture. Job 13, verse 15, Job speaking here says, though he, speaking of God, though he slays me, yet I will hope in him. Matthew 10, verse 28. This is a memory scripture, although for different reasons. Uh, the words of Jesus himself. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, the whole person. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Literally, the fire. Although your translation probably says hell. This is how we must face our personal trials. Even if they're not life or death, we must face our trials with total confidence and faith that God is able to deliver. He can. And second, we must focus our, our you know, what we're doing, what we're thinking, what, our whole approach to it, focus on our obedience and loyalty to him, no matter what may happen happen. That's what you get. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's response to Nebuchadnezzar should be, and I think is, but this is, you know, maybe you haven't heard this before, but should be a go-to scripture for all of us when facing trials. This is a place to go when you're facing trials. There are others, but this is a go-to section of scripture when facing trials. And I think because it provides a balance, a balance of wisdom and faith that we, we need to have. All right, back to, the, back to the action. I tried to find a really cool looking fiery furnace. This isn't very cool looking, but it gives you the idea of what they were doing. Um, so let's read verses 19 through 16. 
it says, then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. So maybe he had been, you know, kind of like favorable to them, and it says his attitude changed. What? I gave you a second chance. I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to work with you guys. His attitude towards them changed, and he ordered the furnace heated up seven times hotter than usual. It's probably a lot like this, except like way bigger, because he's the king, and everything's big when you're a king, right? So they heated up super hot, and he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent, I mean, he's like yelling at the top of his lungs probably, and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. They would have like dropped them in from the top. That's how they would have done it. They would have had a staircase up there or maybe a ramp or something like that. And they would drop them in from the top. So they fell into this fiery furnace. And the king, Nebuchadnezzar, leaped to his feet in amazement. And he asked his advisors, weren't there three men we tied up and threw into the fire? Yes, certainly, your, master, your majesty. <laughs> he said, well, look. And he could have looked because they had these little doors. That's how the furnace would have been. It would have had a, a smelting furnace, would have had a, like a window there for the smelters to look through. And so he would have seen what was going on in the fire. All right? He says, look, look through that door. I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. So this, uh, you know, I, I said this is a, a picture of a, like a, the kind of smelting furnace they would have used in ancient Babylon, although the kings probably would have been a lot bigger and had some fancy decorations on it, but you, it probably would have, would have been built into the back or the side of a mountain or something, or there would have been a ramp up here, and they would have been able to drop them in from the top then they can see the blazing fire and they can see what's going on in there. And Nebuchadnezzar could have looked, like, looked through that window, right? That's just a little touch of reality, how this would all look. And uh, he saw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he saw a fourth person. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, based on his statements, assumes that this fourth was of the race of the gods, as he says. Son of Elah. And possibly, you know, based on other things we read in Scripture, this personage appeared as blazing white light. Doesn't have to be. So was this Christ? Was it a Caribbean? We're not sure. I do not know. Don't have an answer. Interesting to think about. But I don't really have an answer. What matters is that the three were delivered, right? That's what really matters, that they were delivered. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged that this deliverance was the work of the Most High God, or the God of Israel, God of the Jews. Another quick inspirational type scripture, Isaiah 43, verse 2. Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Let's read verse 27 through 30. So, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. 
Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who's set his angel, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any gods except their own god. Therefore, I, Nebuchadnezzar, decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against this god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. This was something Nebuchadnezzar hadn't seen before. A God who actually can deliver. Verse 30, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So all those other Babylonian guys, (laughs) foiled again. Newman. Okay. Now here, the fourth person is referred to as, and and you'll read in your Bible, probably angel. Well, it says Malek. That's the old Hebrew word they would have used. Angel, Malek. They mean the same thing. Malek means a messenger. It means a representative. It can mean an ambassador, which is like the word angelos. It can also mean king. So a Malek here, we you know read that, a Malek, God sent in Malek. Malek could be a carabine. Or it could be a manifestation of God himself. Not clear. I mean, if you think about Genesis 18, verses 1 and 2, you know, the... the God and others appear to Abraham, not as a blazing light, but in the appearance of men. So God does appear sometimes. I believe that would be the one who became Jesus Christ. So he is with you. He is with you, can be with you, and he is a God who delivers. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was a military man. He was a fighting man, and he was a politician. You don't get to the top of the food chain in a place like Babylon without having some some grit. And uh, he was was probably a very practical guy who valued results. I would expect that's the kind of guy we were dealing with here. And he recognized power when he saw it. But, you know, that's what you'd expect. God's sort of (laughs) interacting with Nebuchadnezzar in a way he can understand. Power, all right? And, uh, you know, his response is, he says, wow, I'm seeing some real power here. He might have also been making an attempt to appease this very powerful God who has just greatly offended by abusing his followers. He might have thought, ooh, (gasps) I need to do something to take care of this. And he promotes them and does other good stuff for them. Don't really know. Um, But again, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, even though he responds and says, wow, I'm seeing the power, he still is not, I believe, to be considered as converted to the true faith. We know from what else we read about him that he remains a polytheistic guy. He still worships Marduk but he does respect the power of Yahweh. He's seen it in action, and he says, I respect that. I respect the power I see. Now, why, why is this particular sequence of events recorded for generations and generations and generations to read about? What's so great about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? I would expect that the Jewish people suffered all kinds of nasty stuff. They were dragged off by the Babylonians from Jerusalem in chains, sometimes worse, you know, with meat hooks and all that kind of crazy stuff. I would think that all kinds of people were suffering. What's with these guys? Well, first, you know, they had the attention of the the king, right? I mean, other people, though, they might have uh, had pressure to assimilate. This seemed only to be focused on government officials, but I would expect that it percolated out into all kinds of the territories of Babylon where people were expected to assimilate. That's the way the Babylonians thought. 
Become a good Babylonian. Things will go better for you. Join, the, you know, join this great nation that we've got here. Give up your old ways and let's just like be one big happy people. As long as we're in charge and we get all the money. There would have been pressure to bow down and there would have been pressure to knuckle under to the state, worship the state. It's kind of what I think is going on here. But what happened? What did, what did Nebuchadnezzar say after this stuff happened? Something very specific happened that was very, I think, important. First thing. Legal protection for the Jewish people. If you think about what Nebuchadnezzar said, through this horrible trial, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and their faith brought about a change in law. But Nebuchadnezzar made a law. You can't harass these people anymore. If I hear anything against this God of power, we're, <laughs> we're going to tear you to pieces. We're going to knock down your house and kill all your family, that kind of stuff. So legal protection for the enslaved Jewish people so that they would not have to assimilate. I mean, God didn't take away all their trials and tests, but he made it possible. He gave them a way out. He gave them a way out so they would not have to assimilate and they would not disappear into history. Because God still had a purpose for those exiled Jews. And he works out matters so that they can survive. And he will work out matters for you. Now later in the history of the Jewish people, at the appointed time, they will be or would be allowed to return back to the Holy Land. They would be a shadow of what they had formerly been in glory and, and so forth. But they were a very scrupulous people when they came back. And that would set the stage for the first coming of the Messiah. God still had a purpose for these people. He didn't want them to disappear. And the suffering and the faith of these three men appears to have had great meaning in God's plan, a way in which God moved things forward, it kept the plan going, if you will. Now, your trials and my trials may not affect the course of geopolitics, but I think it's important that we always view our trials as having meaning and purpose in the work of spiritual creation that God is doing. It's a perspective that we must have if we get to get through trials. We might not even know what it is. I don't know that, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew, aha, this is going to work it out so that we'll have legal protection in the, in the land. I doubt very much whether that was going through their mind when they, they took their stand. It just happened, right? They had to face it on their own resources, you know, emotional, intellectual, spiritual resources. But look what happened. It affected everybody, really, if you think about it. Everybody was benefited. God's plan moved forward. Okay, so that's kind of big picture stuff. Second thing that's going on here, the proof that God has the power to deliver. Now, you know, Babylon had defeated Judah militarily. They'd taken over the land. They'd ransacked Jerusalem, hauled everybody off as slaves. To the, the pagan mind, they would have believed that this victory over the foreign nation of Judah was proof of the superior power of, of their national deity. And through these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God provides a witness that he is more than the God of Israel. He is the true living God with complete sovereignty over all created things. So their example, you know, you might think, well, that's them. You know, I didn't see it. How's that going to really, you know, how's that going to give me what it takes to get through a trial? Well, you've seen, I think, I'll bet most of you have seen God's hand at work in someone's life. If you're willing to accept it, I know I have. I have seen prayers answered. I have seen people saved from death. Not all the time, though, but I have seen it. Remember those things. Remember those things. They are a witness to you. God can deliver. The third, 
encouragement in present trials. The personal example of these three men is recorded to encourage the faithful people of God. That's you. And this story, if you will, record, should be a go-to place in Scripture for you. Go to Hebrews 11. I mean, in, in, in Corinthians, Paul says, you know, why are these things recorded? Why do we have the history of Israel? This would be in chapter 10. Why were these things recorded? It's for your benefit. This is what Paul says. These things are recorded for you so that you can look back on them and, and, and gain encouragement from them. In Hebrews 11, verse 3, God's word says to you and to me, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Now, the verse I want is verse 6. Without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So you have to believe. And you have to trust. And that's how you get through trials. And that's how you get through life. So, conclusion. So, what do we get from this? I think there are a few things we can walk walk away with. One, set your priorities right. I, I don't get the picture from the narrative that we read that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a lot of time. It seemed like events just kind of, right? So it's not like, they, well, hold on. Let us take a couple of days and we'll pray and fast about it, right? I don't see that in there. I, feel, I see it kind of coming down real fast. And um, to be ready to face this sort of a situation, they had to be mentally prepared, right? So they had to have thought these things through in advance. Where, where will I fall if something like that happens? So too, we should have that same kind of mental preparation for stuff that might happen. Not that we want to get grim, you know, and always be thinking about doomsday scenarios, but also to be mentally prepared for what can happen. You know, if the commandments of men conflict with your obedience to God, you must choose to obey God rather than human government or your boss at work or whatever authority figure is messing with you. So set your priorities straight. Be ready in advance, because you might not have a lot of time to thrash it all out. Two, set a good example for others in how you face trials. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I said it's a go-to scripture. Why? Because of what, you know, their response is the thing that's the go-to scripture. Right? Set a good example in how you deal with trials. It can be encouraging to others. They did that and it's helpful for you and me. Right? It's a cycle. It goes around. Three, have confidence that God is able to deliver. More than just like knowing about the Sabbath or knowing about the holy days, which is all good, know that God is the God of power and that he can and he wants to work with you and he can deliver. He's able to deliver. Four, understand that God is not bound to act upon your demands. God, you've got to save me right now and this is how I want it done. God doesn't have to do what we say. He does have the freedom not to deliver us from physical trials. But in doing so, when he does so, he is working out his good purpose. He's working out his good purpose. So in conclusion, and this came up actually in the scripture reading, I thought, well, that's interesting. The conclusion of the scripture reading was sort of the same. Nothing is impossible for God. Remember that and take it to the bank.